All right, let's finish these notes. This is the second attempt. Um, I had to cut off the first video. No worries, it's okay. Uh, but let's let's finish these nine three notes. Uh, and the the new stuff in the, in the at the end of these nine three notes is going to be talking about outliers. How do we formally define and identify whether we have an outlier or not? Uh, and then also in the process of finding outliers, we're gonna we're gonna come up with these things called fences. So fences and outliers. That's really the last things we're gonna add on. Uh, an outlier, obviously, we can see the definition. It's, it's something that's just substantially different than the rest of your data. It could be uh, a lot bigger than the majority of your data, or it could be uh, significantly smaller. Uh, but it's just something in your data that's very different from the rest of it, right? Uh, and, and what we really want to remember is that those outliers can have a very big effect on the mean, on the average, whether it's a sample or a population. The presence of that outlier affects the mean fairly dramatically. Remember when we talked about symmetry, we have uh, symmetrical distribution, or we could be skewed to the right if the tail goes to the right, or we could be skewed to the left if the tail goes to the left. Typically, those tails come up with the presence of outliers. They don't always technically have to be outliers. It could just be how your data is spread. And the data could be safe, and it could not be an outlier. Uh, but if you have an outlier, almost certainly you will have some type of a tail. So they're, they're like a little red flag warning for you that, hey, there's, there could be some outliers if you've got that tail. Uh, but the mean always gets pulled in the direction of the tail. So if you've got some data points that are like substantially larger than the bulk of your data, then that's going to skew your mean. It's going to get pulled in that positive direction to the right. It also affects the median. Like that median gets nudged to the right a little bit. But typically the median doesn't get changed a whole lot. Now, I mean, if you've got like 10 outliers, then I don't really know if they're all outliers. It's probably just a really bad set of data. Uh, but uh, if you have quite a lot of them, then of course it can have a bigger effect. Uh, but usually you just have like one or two outliers, and so it doesn't affect the median. It doesn't nudge that middle number too far either direction. It, it likely will change it, although it's possible that the median stays the same. But for sure, the presence of outliers and, and graphically those tails, the feature of the graph, the tail, uh, that's going to tell us that the mean is going to get affected. The mean, the average, gets pulled in the direction of the tail quite a bit. The, the median just gets nudged a little bit, and the mode you know, doesn't change at all. All right, so how do we find whether something is an outlier? Because this definition is kind of subjective, like it just says, hey, it's very different. Well, what does very different mean? How do we uh, formalize that? And how do we actually identify what's quote unquote very different? Uh, well, we're going to have this thing that I, I kind of call tolerance, or you can think about it as wiggle room. Uh, I got to figure out how much extra wiggle room or how much tolerance can I have? And then if I go past that tolerance, or if I extend past that wiggle room, those things would then be considered outliers. And here is how we formalize uh, that wiggle room, or that tolerance. We're gonna create these things called fences. And those fences are gonna create our parameters for what's considered safe and is not an outlier, and anything outside of the fence will be an outlier. So I'm just gonna draw like a basic box and whisker plot. So let's just say, we can even go back to the one we kind of had earlier. It looked kind of sort of like this. Uh, we have the Q1, we have the Q, actually, I'm going to make mine smaller because I know where this graph is going, so I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Uh, let's say uh, we have something like this. So I've got the Q1, the Q2, and the Q3. And let's say uh, we could have some tails, uh, so we've got something over there, and let's say this one goes like farther. My number line doesn't go that far left, whatever. Uh, so I kind of have a box and whisker plot. It's going to bother me. I'm going to fix it. Okay, there we go. I fixed it. There it is. It looks terrible, but I fixed it. Uh, so what we're going to do is create these fences. And the fences are going to tell us, hey, anything that's safely within the fence is, is not an outlier. But if anything goes outside of the fence, then, then it is an outlier. And how we find those fences is that we're going to have to take the interquartile range. Right, so we're going to have to find that IQR, remember that's the spread of your middle 50%, Q3 minus Q1. I'm going to have to find that spread, that width, and I'm going to actually take the one, uh, the IQR, and I'm going to multiply it by 1.5. Right, so basically 150%. If I take the IQR and, and I write it on the side, so if I take that IQR and I do it like this, and if I do a half of it again, I have 1.5, and I'm going to have it, and I'm going to have half of it again. Uh, or if I take that 1.5, let me do it in a different color. If I do 1.5 times the IQR, uh, then that's going to give us that upper fence. Again, the IQR is the width, 
from Q1 to Q3. And then if I take that, uh, that Q3, and if I add in that wiggle room, again, that wiggle room, you can call this the tolerance, or you can call it the wiggle room. I don't really know if there's a formal name for it. I, I think tolerance is fine or wiggle room. Uh, but how we find the upper fence is I'm going to take the quartile three and I'm going to add in that tolerance. So I'm going to add in the 1.5 times the IQR. And then when I find that tolerance or that wiggle room, that tells me basically how much more safe space do I have past quartile three. And then if I had a data point to the right of the upper fence, that would be formally defined and identified as an outlier. If I have data points that are within, right, if this is my upper fence, any data point that's within the fence is safe. And if you have a data point that is on the fence, that's safe. It's strictly the stuff that is past the fence that is considered to be an outlier. And how we find it is we take the IQR, multiply it by 1.5, that tells us our wiggle room, and we either add it to quartile three, or to find this one, uh, we would subtract it from, that's probably too much. Uh, we subtract it from uh, the quartile one. Right, so we could take quartile one and then subtract the tolerance, 1.5 times the IQR. Right, so we have this wiggle room, this tolerance, 1.5 times the IQR. You either add it to the, the quartile three, that gives us our upper fence, and then we could subtract it from the quartile one, that tells us our lower fence. And so here it looks like that, that point all the way on the left, uh, this one, it would be an outlier because it's past that lower fence. Right? So we have this wiggle room, the tolerance, 1.5 times the IQR, and I add it to the quartile three, I add it, or subtract it from the quartile one. Again, uh, the quartile two is irrelevant. You do not use that as your reference point. It's from the ends of the box. It's from quartile three to the right, and then from quartile one to the left. Not the median, not quartile two, be careful. The 1.5 times the IQR, that's our wiggle room. That's our tolerance. Add it to the quartile three to get the upper fence, subtract it from the, one, uh, the quartile one that's our lower fence. Anything within the fences or on the fences is safe, not an outlier. Anything outside of the fences is an outlier. All right, example. The Oswalds are shopping for gloves. They found eight pairs of gloves with, uh, with the front. I'm going to get rid of it because it's bothering me. I'm going to get rid of that stuff. Uh, they found eight pairs of gloves with the following prices. Would I consider, uh, what would I consider to be the outlier? Well, we can kind of answer this question without doing math. Like, we can tell, hey, 17, 15, 3, 12, 13, 16, 19, 19. Like, hey, 3 is, like, pretty different than everything else. Like, everything else is 12 to 19, like, fairly close together. And then 3 is, you know, kind of that oddball, right? So it appears that 3 could be an outlier. But we have to mathematically prove that it's an outlier by finding the wiggle room and then subtracting it from quartile one or adding it to quartile three. And then I have to decide if those data points that I think may be outliers, are they actually past our fences? Uh, we can't just eyeball test it. We actually need to prove that it's an outlier and it's easy. Uh, we just basically need to do the five number summary, find the quartile one and three, find the IQR, use that information times 1.5 uh, to get the, the wiggle room tolerance, get our fences, and then we can see if stuff is all inside our fences or not. So let's reorder it. Let's reorder this data. I got 3, 12, 13, 3, 12, 13. I got a 15, I got a 16, I got a 17, and a 2, 19. So let's show 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Got them all. Very good. Right. So we're thinking that that lower extreme may be the outlier, but let's confirm it. First things first, let's find the median. Since we have an even number of terms, we're going to have to average two of them, right? I have eight, so the average of the fourth and the fifth is going to end up being uh, our median. Does it even ask us to do the five numbers number? Oh, oh, well. But it, oh well, but we're going to do it anyways. So there's the lower extreme. Uh, here's the upper extreme. Uh, and then we have the quartile two. And then if I was trying to find the quartile one, remember I would look at everything to the left of the median and then everything to the right of the median is what I would use for Q3. Uh, but here I'm gonna have one, two, three, four data points to the left of Q2. So averaging those would give us Q1. So 12.5 is gonna be our Q1. And then if I look to the right of the, the middle, right, if I look at the right half of the data, 
averaging those is going to give us Q3. So that's what we're looking at at. So we've got our five number summary. Uh, we could do our box and whisker plot. I'm just not going to bother. Uh, let's just look at the important stuff from it. Uh, we have the Q1 and the Q3. So our IQR, which is just the Q3 minus the Q1, uh, we can find it pretty easily. And here it's 5.5. Now we don't add the we don't add the IQR right. If we're thinking about our fences, we don't we don't add it from uh, Q3 and Q1. We don't add just the IQR. We actually have to take the IQR and then times 1.5. So let's take 5.5 and let's multiply it by 1.5. And this is going to give us our tolerance, aka our uh, wiggle room, if you will. And that is 8.25. So that's our tolerance. Now what we're going to have to do is take quartile 3 and then add the tolerance, add that wiggle room, uh, and then we would also take quartile 1 and subtract it. And we're thinking 3 is on the low end of the spectrum, and so we're going to have to subtract it, but we can find the upper fence as well. Uh, so upper fence, there we go, and then the lower fence, uh, there we go. Let's plug it. Quartile 3 was uh, 18, so if we took 18 plus uh, 8.25, that upper fence uh, is going to end up being 26.25. So if I had any data point that was like 20, uh, 25, 26, if I had a 26.25, that would also be safe. The fence is safe. But if I had a, a pair of gloves that cost $27, outlier. Anything past this will be an outlier. Okay, the fence is safe. Anything past it is an outlier. All right, very good. Let's look at the lower extreme. Our quartile 1 was 12.5, and the 12.5 minus uh, the 8.25, uh, that's going to end up telling us 4.25. So that's our lower fence. So if we're thinking about our range, uh, or I guess our domain of acceptable values, things that are not considered outliers, 4.25 up to 26.25, those are the things that are safe. Those are the things that are not outliers. Uh, and if I have anything past that 26.25 on the right, or anything past less than the 4.25 on the left, uh, that, would be, uh, the, that would be the indicator of the outlier. Again, find the IQR, multiply it by 1.5, add it to quartile 3, subtract it from quartile 1, uh, and then we can, find, uh, we can find whether we have an outlier. Uh, so we did actually confirm that, yes, that is an outlier. We confirmed it. 3 is an outlier. And let's see what that outlier is going to do uh, in, this, in this example. Let's find the mean and the median with the outlier, so including the 3 in that data set, uh, and then we'll do it without. Right? So we're going to throw out the outlier because we know they can skew our data, uh, and then we can, we can kind of figure out what the, what the differences will be. All right, so let us look. I'm going to do it with the dark blue. Let's look at this one. So with the outlier. We already have the quartile 2, right? It was 15.5. We, we had the numbers. We just didn't ever write it out. Uh, so here our median was 15.5. And then our mean, if we added all eight of those numbers together, right? If I added the sum uh, of all those eight, starting with Let's say i equals 1 all the way to n equals 8. If I added all of them up, I guess I should do i, whatever, n equals 1 to n equals 8. If I added all of them up and I divided by 8, right, to find the average, uh, I could then take that sum, divide it by 8, uh, and the mean should end up being 14.25. That's what I have written down, so hopefully it's right, right? If I add all eight numbers together, divide it by 8, uh, you're going to end up getting 14.25. Okay, now let's see what happens if we toss if we chuck out the outlier. So now I'm going to uh, ignore the three. Uh, so let's see what would happen. Right? Obviously, that's going to affect some stuff, because uh, now I'm not going to have to, you know, I'm just looking now at these seven numbers, right? I'm ignoring the stuff uh, and ignoring the three. So if I only have seven numbers, now the median is just going to be that fourth term by itself. So now my median isn't the average of two terms. Now my average is just one term and it's 16. So it did shift. It shifted slightly, a little bit, but not a whole lot. Uh, the median was pretty close to being about the same. Uh, but now let's see, if I add all those terms together and I divide, right, just, just the seven terms. If I add all those seven terms together, ignoring the outlier, 
if I added them all together and I divided it by 7, the mean uh, is going to end up being 15.857. So if we think about whether that 3, whether that outlier has an effect, the answer is yes. Right? If you think about the data without the outlier, uh, we have the 16 and then the 15.9 you know, if we rounded the three figures. If I include that one extra data point, if I include that one outlier kind of to the left, we have that tail that's going slightly to the left, have the presence of that one outlier, it moves the needle on the median a little bit, like one half to the left. It's going to drag that median out a little bit, but it moves the mean quite a bit more. Right? Those outliers have a much larger effect on the average than they do the median. It's possible it may not even affect the median at all, usually it will, but uh, it usually won't do it a whole lot, uh, but it will typically always have a pretty significant effect on it. Right. Outliers affect the mean the most. Big thing to take away. All right, so there we go. We got our outliers, uh, we got our, our tolerance, our wiggle room. Remember, 1.5 times the IQR, that's something you need to remember. 1.5 times the IQR, that's our wiggle room, that's our tolerance. We add it to quartile 3, or we subtract it from quartile one. It's how we find the fences. Anything on or in, in the fences is safe past the fences on either end uh, outliers. All right, uh, let's look at this last example and I've already made it super cluttered. So let me try to get rid of some stuff. Uh, we're looking at this thing called the empirical rule, which we're going to work with more in the future. We're kind of just introducing it now uh, to kind of just get a little taste and so that when we see it again in the future, it's like, oh, I remember those numbers, right? They, they came up in the past. Uh, and so here we go. Let's talk about this empirical rule. And it pretty much just affects, uh, it really just applies to symmetrical data, although uh, you could try to apply it to things that aren't perfectly symmetrical. But you know, the, the closer it is to symmetrical, the, the more accurate this is going to be. If you start having a tail on one side or the other, uh, then, then these percentages will get skewed a little bit. But uh, we have these normal distributions, which we'll talk about these symmetrical bell curves. Uh, the empirical rule uh, essentially is going to describe how that, uh, how that data is going to be kind of distributed within standard deviation. Right? I have the mean, since this mu is going to stand for the mean of the population, and we have that sigma, which stands for the standard deviation. And that's essentially going to be like a little scale or a stepping size uh, for, for how we're going to mark off our, X, our, our labels on our x value. Uh, and so let's look at it. We have a, a standard bell curve. If you don't have this drawn, uh, you would probably want to freeze the video, uh, draw something like this, uh, and we have the median that's right there. Not the median. We have the mean right there. The, mean would be the, the median would be there also. Uh, but we have the average, the mean, right there in the middle. Now, what this says is that if I take the average, the mean, and I add either plus or I subtract the minus, if I do plus or minus one standard deviation, that's like our step size. If I take uh, one standard deviation step size uh, in each direction. If I go one step to the right, one step to the left, then what this empirical rule tells us is that uh, we should have, right, if we're thinking about between plus or minus one standard deviation, we should have 68% of the data. Right? A good majority of the data, since it's symmetrical, uh, a good majority of the data is going to be right in the middle of that graph. Right? If I take the average, and I take one step, one standard deviation to the right, and if I do one step, one standard deviation to the left, uh, that should encapsulate uh, and, and it should represent 68% of the data. It may not be exactly 68, but it's typically going to be pretty darn close. Okay, now let's look at the next one. It says, what if I, what if I take two steps, Mr. Bell? What if we take the average, the mean, and I do two standard deviations? So now I'm going to go out here, uh, and I'm going to come out here. Right? What if I encapsulate two standard deviations? How much of the data is that going to have? Well, if I start at the average, and then I encapsulate two units worth, I take two steps, right? one, two to the right, and one, two to the left. Uh, if I take the average, and I add or I subtract two standard deviations, that should give us 95% of our data a good overwhelming majority of the data, right? It's starting with the average and then taking two steps. The step size is our standard deviation. Then you can take two steps in either direction. That's going to get the, the overwhelming majority, 95% of our data, right? of our measurements. And then the last one, if I do another step, 
if I go uh, three steps, if I take the mean and I add or I subtract three standard deviations, so I'm going to go one, two, three, I'm going to come up here. And then if I do one, two, three, I'm going to come down here. Well, then uh, what the empirical world tells us is that if I take the average and I add or I subtract three steps, three standard deviations, then that should cover 99.7% of the data. Right, let me erase this so you can see the, two, the three numbers, because uh, those numbers are going to keep coming up. 68, 95, 99.7. Uh, those are the three numbers that come from this empirical rule. And, and it's telling us, hey, if I start with the mean and I kind of gradually work my way outwards, one step, two steps, three steps, again, standard deviation. It gives us that step size. It's going to essentially tell us like, how wide is our data going to be? What step size is appropriate? to encapsulate these specific uh, percentages of the data. Uh, that's our standard deviation. Uh, but if I do one step in either direction, 68%. If I do two steps, 95%. And then if I do three steps, uh, it should almost be everything, right? 99.7. Like right? there, there usually is going to be some stuff past that third standard deviation uh, on the right and on the left, but typically not very many. Right? So uh, this empirical rule, we're going to see it like, more later but it really talks about if I take the average and then I apply step sizes, if I apply that standard deviation in both directions, what percentages of the data are we going to have within those, uh, within those parameters? 68, 95, 99.7. Uh, you are going to want to remember those numbers. They will come up fairly often. Uh, not a whole lot in this class, but if you take any more statistics uh, classes or college classes, uh, yeah, statistics classes in college, that's what I meant to say. That those three numbers do come up, and you're expected to know them. 68, 95, 99.7.